Welcome to, I guess this is episode three of uh, Doctor Who Book Club. Uh, if you remember the last episode, we were going to do um, the comic books next. Uh, we are going to do Klepton Parasites. Uh, but a handful of things happened. A couple of things happened. First of all, I read the Klepton Parasites, and I was like, well, I don't think I have enough to say about this. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to, I guess, read maybe all of the first Doctor Comics from the TV comics. And there's like 31 of those. And I was like, maybe I'll read all of those. Uh, and then I decided that that's probably too much. But anyways, uh, I got this idea in my head, this notion, especially since, um, you know, one of the comics that they do is uh, on the web planet. It's a sequel to the episode the web or the serial the web planet um i started to think to myself am i missing something without the context of the actual show in here <laughs> and i was starting to think yeah i probably am i'm probably am missing the context like that's it's probably important so i got to thinking well if i'm doing the comics this way and i'm gonna like cover a bunch of them what if I just did the show that way? Because initially the problem was the reason I didn't want to cover the show was because I didn't want to go episode by episode or like serial by serial because I was like most of what I'm going to be covering is probably going to be the show and that kind of defeats the purpose of like what I'm trying to do here. It was like I want to focus on the extended media and not the show <laughs> but if I'm just covering like you know 20 episodes of the show in a row it's like what's the point of this? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but then I started to get thinking, what if I just cover them season by season? What if I do that? So I watch a whole season, and then I cover it, and then I feel like that's a good idea. I feel like it solves all the problems. You know, I won't have a billion episodes, and I will be able to <laughs> add the necessary context of the show. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have like much of a visual to show here. Uh, this time around, so just bear with me. I guess I'm just doing it this way. This way is should be okay. So there are eight serials in the first season of Doctor Who. Um, and we have our first TARDIS team, I guess they're called. Uh, Barbara, Ian, Susan, and the Doctor. I guess I'll just start off with the first serial, which is uh, an unearthly child, I will say. I liked the first episode of An Unearthly Child. I don't like the the following three episodes. <laughs> Not really my thing. I feel like it's a very generic story. I feel like I've seen this this tale done a thousand times. Um, so the An Unearthly Child is a serial that covers. It's four episodes long. But the first episode is really the setup to get them on the TARDIS and going exploring. And then the next three episodes, they arrive back in, like, caveman times. And then there's this whole plot with the cavemen. Um, it's actually interesting because it's not they're not actually cavemen. They're, um, well, they are. But, like, it's often mistaken that they, they went back in time on Earth. But it's established in the episode that they actually go to another planet. That it's not, it's not Earth. It's actually another planet. But when they talk about it later on, they also actually refer to it as, like, caveman times. But they say in the serial that it's 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 another planet. So I I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing. I, I but I don't really like that part of it. It's like they get captured. Like the whole every time they do a caveman thing, it's like they don't really know what to do. It's like it's either has something to do with like creating fire or it has something to do with like creating a wheel, right? It's like one of those two things, and then otherwise it's like nothing else. In this episode, it's. Uh, creating fire. So they've got this society where, like, these two cavemen are, like, fighting over who can create fire first, and they see the doctor creating fire, and they're like, oh, we'll capture these people, and then he'll, we'll, he'll create fire for us, and then we'll be able to, I'll be able to, I'll be the leader. And then they escape, and then they, uh, get followed by that guy again, and then that guy, um like gets hurt and then they help him and then they get captured again and then they just leave 
after that. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, I, I'm not a big fan of, of the first four episodes. Um, the first episode's decent, though, because it, it does a good job of establishing everything else. I just wanted to talk about the rest of this serial first, because I feel like it is kind of, it, it does kind of suck. So in the first episode, uh, basically an unearthly child, it doesn't refer to the doctor, if you may have thought that that's the case, it's not. It refers to Susan, um, who is basically going to skill, uh, school, going to school at Coal Hill High School, Coal Hill School. Uh, she's like 15, um, and her two school teachers, uh, Ian Chesterton and Barbara Wright, they think she's real weird. Uh, she's, for one, super smart. She seems to know the answer to every question. And at the same time, she also finds school far too easy. Like, she's, she, she keeps asking to be challenged more, that they're covering topics that are a little too simplistic and easy. But it comes to a head when uh, Barbara uh, decides to check in on Susan and finds out that the address she has listed is actually a junkyard which is really strange and she confides in ian chesterton um a science teacher barbara is a history teacher and she's like let's go to this junkyard and see what's like going on and they follow susan and they find out yes she does go into this junkyard and they follow her into the junkyard only to uh, uh, by the way 76 totters lane that's probably like an important doctor who uh trivia fact is to know the address of the junkyard. <laughs> um, Coal Hill School is uh, also like a, a Doctor Who trivia effect. It's also the school at which, if you're familiar with the modern Doctor Who era, it's the school at which Clara teaches. Um, same school. But anyways, they enter the uh, this junkyard, and then they hear somebody coming, they hide, and uh, they see an old man come in. And this old man goes, oh, they come in. Th the only thing in the junkyard that they see is a blue police block blocks a blue police blocks blue police box and then they <laughs> the doctor goes it goes i'm uh, sorry the old man he goes and he he goes up to the police box and he's going to open it and they decide oh well maybe like, well, we know susan came in here maybe he knows where susan is so they decide to go up to him and talk to him um and he's very like dismissive and standoffish he's like trying to like you know, it's, they're, they're questioning him. He's like, oh, I don't know, uh, 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 whatever. And they determine that they're like, well, he's acting really suspicious. Like, maybe we should call the police. Um, and he's like, no, don't call the police. And then uh, they hear Susan from inside the police box calling out to her grandfather. Um, and then they follow him into the police box and... Oh, we we find out that it's bigger on the inside. It's the TARDIS, and the Doctor and Susan are aliens from another planet. I was gonna say I was like kind of gaslit. I feel like by the extended media that I'm like maybe like a lot of these change the origin to make the Doctor human and from the planet Earth that he's got a lot of connections on Earth. And I'm like maybe they just didn't like establish this really well early on in the show. But no, in the first episode they state. They're like exiles from their home planet, and they can't go back. So they are aliens. They are aliens, established in the first episode. So that's kind of cool. Um, I don't know why they, like, other things are so determined to make him a human. <laughs> it's le far less interesting. Anyways, the Doctor decides to kidnap these two teachers. He decides to put the TARDIS into uh, commission, and he decides to move them. Because he's basically afraid that they're going to, like, contact the police. They're going to, like, call somebody. And then they're going to be, like, screwed, right? They're, there's, like, oh, the, the people won't understand. Uh, and and uh, that they'll be arrested. I, I think it's a very stupid reason. So the doctor essentially kidnaps these two school teachers. Um, and that's how we start off the show. <laughs> um i again i again i think it's stupid just because like they could have just left you know they didn't need to take the school teachers with them it's like they just left to like 30 years in the future you know who, the, the, the the teachers that that go out to the police and say hey there's this weird guy and he's he's got like this weird box and they like disappeared and and 
they said they were aliens and they disappeared. It's like nobody's going to believe those people, right? And you could just pop up 30 years later and like nobody's even going to think about it at all. So it is kind of, a, 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 I think, a little dumb. But um, at the same time, I don't care because <laughs> this, this, this is a good team. The, the, the early TARDIS team is pretty good. They all have their own strengths, and I, I do find it kind of an interesting dynamic that there is, like, a growth to the dynamic, I guess, in that at first they're all very kind of distrusting of each other, um, that they do kind of grow into, like, a very cohesive sort of family dynamic over the course of this, which is very cute. Um but essentially that's I mean I've that's unearthly child. I d I'm not I don't I like the first episode. It's a good setup. It's a good setup. The other episodes, I don't care. <laughs> um <coughs> and I don't think the, the the writer of the first episode first series of episodes came back. I don't believe so. I don't think he comes back for a while. But season one is is pretty simplistic. It's pretty good. But I will say, early on, it has some really, really fantastic episodes. And I think that's what put Doctor Hit Who on, on the map. I'm kind of surprised by like how good some of the early episodes are. Uh, especially considering, I mean, with an asterisk. Because I, I feel like the first serial, not great. <laughs> but... Uh, the second serial is literally the Daleks, uh, written by Terry Nation, and revisiting this, I, I'm quite impressed by this, like, the serial is really good, um, for a handful of reasons, um, I think it's just, like, the mythology of it is, like, much more complex than I remembered, it is, like, a very well-defined, uh, sci-fi story, almost the, the kind of sci-fi story that you could read a novel about um, entirely. Like, the mythology is is super interesting. There's this whole mythology of the, the, the Daleks who used to be called, like, the the Dolls, or I don't remember. There was the Daleks and the Talls, and they used to be at war, and then there was a neutron war, and then they blew each other up with, like, a neutron bomb, which devastated the planet, and then it mutated both the Daleks and the Talls, but the Talls also mutated back to become the Talls, like the, these like perfected human beings or creatures, I guess, humanoids. Um, whereas the Daleks just mutated and now they're these like hideous monsters. Other than that, they live in this like dead city um, and they're, it's on the edge of this like petrified forest and they talk about how like outside of the city there's like tons of mutated creatures weird looking creatures there's a swamp kind of uh that they that they go through at at a time um it's worth mentioning that like early on uh a lot of these like I, i'm calling these serials because these aren't individual episodes uh the serials are several episodes <laughs> most of the time um up to i think what's the longest one in this um, actually, this is one of the longest ones. It's seven episodes. This and I think Marco Polo are both seven episodes long. Um, and th this is a good and a bad thing because I feel like it allows the story a lot of room to sort of breathe. It allows the setup of a lot of different characters to be established, to be uh, to change. Um, it's it a lot. Uh, it allows a lot of like individual stories within a larger narrative to be told i think we'll see more of that in like the keys of marinus but i will say about the daleks i feel like it goes on a little bit too long i feel like once they get to the point where they escape the city uh which is like the third episode uh i feel like it starts to drag a little bit because that's when they go to the camp with the talls and then they have to sneak back into the city the whole setup of this is essentially they land on 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 Scaro, the planet of the Daleks, um, but they don't know anything about it at this point. But the Doctor's very curious, and they're like, "Well, we gotta explore. Let's explore. Let's see what's." Uh, and it's one of the major traits of the Doctor at this point is just his curiosity, his scientific curiosity, and everything. He doesn't really care too much about the safety of <laughs> the people around him 
or even helping people necessarily. Uh, what he cares about first and foremost is, like I said, is scientific curiosity and appeasing that. So he sees a, this, this planet that's seemingly deserted, and there's a bunch of weird stuff on it, and he's like, oh, I, gotta go, I gotta go explore. Um, and he does one of the th things that's a, kind of reprehensible um, early on, which is that he basically lies to them and says, oh, I can't pilot the TARDIS because of this little device that I pulled out of the TARDIS. Oh, we're out of mercury. I need mercury in order to power the TARDIS. And so he's like, we have to go to the city to find Mercury. And they all believe him, but he's clear, like he is lying in that moment. So it's kind of a shitty thing that he does because he puts all of their lives in danger. Um, I will say the first time I watched this, uh, this season, I, the first time I watched the first Doctor, I did think he was kind of an asshole. I really didn't like him um, just because I thought he was really selfish and kind of reckless. Um. And I, I will say with a lot of these early episodes, he's not, like, as bad as I remember, because I remember him being pretty bad. Uh, but I think it's, like, Edge of Destruction, where he's kind of the worst, which is the next serial. Um, but in, in between, like, An Unearthly Child and the Daleks, he does, like, apologize for being shitty <laughs> a lot of the time. Like, there, there's the, the time in An Unearthly Child when they get captured by the caveman. He does apologize. He's like, oh, my bad. I have put you all in danger. I brought you here, and now we're all in danger, and we might die. And like, that that was kind of bad of me to do. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it was kind of cool to see him acknowledging that. I thought he was kind of, he kind of sucks early on, but, um, yep. Oh, there's some obvious stuff to mention here. Um, he does acknowledge the chameleon circuit. It's a big source of Doctor Who trivia. Why does the TARDIS look like a blue police? Oh, gosh, there's so much lore that I didn't even cover in the first thing first of all the 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 idea of the tardis is um said by susan she she says she came up with the the term tardis time and relative dimensions in space she says she came up with that in an un unearthly child <laughs> she says she came up with that um which is later retcons as all tardises are called tardises it's just the name of the machine, so it's no way... Like, I don't know. In modern day, doesn't really add up that Susan came up with that, but that's what they say. So, Yeah, but the, the chameleon circuit, right? He, so they arrive in the time of the Daleks. No, sorry. They arrive in an unearthly child in the caveman times, and he's like, huh, that's weird. My TARDIS didn't change from being a blue police box. It's still a blue police box. It's like, oh, most curious, something must be wrong. Hmm, hmm, most curious indeed, hmm. That's how he sounds. The chameleon circuit is broken already, and realistically, the reason that they do this, we can assume, is just because it saves a lot of, I don't know, <laughs> them having to build a prop that looks like the TARDIS every time they could just reuse this blue police box over and over again. I do find it interesting early on in the Daleks, uh, they basically there's this there's this plot point that like the the planet is super irradiated. They try to they check for it early on and then they mistakenly like look away from the dial and it turns out that the dial is actually starts leaning closer to like oh this planet's super irradiated. So over the course of the the few episodes they get really sick, um, but the doctor gets most sick, which I think is interesting to mention just because. I don't know. In like modern day, I think like Doctor Who, his phy physiology is so different that they often treat him as like above everything. But in this, they definitely treat him as like an old, frail old man. And so oftentimes, if everyone's getting sick, he's the most sick. If everyone's getting tired, he's the most tired because he's an old man, right? <laughs> he's tired, he's frail, he's dying. Uh, he can't do much. He can't, he can barely get around. But yeah, like I said, I, th I think the later episodes of this are kind of a little, a little dull. They team up with the Talls. Uh, they escape the prison. Basically, the Daleks initially want the Talls to give them their, like, anti-radiation drug. And then they get the anti-radiation drug. And then it, it actually starts hurting the Daleks. They start getting, they go, go crazy and start dying after taking the anti-radiation drug. And then they find out... 
oh, we actually are like so irradiated and mutated that we actually require radiation to exist. Um, so they decide what they're going to do is launch a neutron bomb and devastate the entire planet, killing everything, but it'll make uh, everything, it'll make the environment optimal for Dalek life. And of course, they love that idea, and there's no Daleks that are like, that's a bad idea, we shouldn't do that. They all actually quite love the idea of Dalek dominance, surprisingly. The last, like, four episodes are them just sneaking back in, um, and kind of inadvertently, they don't really know about the neutron bomb until, like, the very end, and so they stop the Daleks from launching the neutron bomb. Um, and, oh, the whole reason they have to sneak back in is because that, that thing that the doctor pulls out of the TARDIS, and he's like, oh, we're out of mercury. My This little thing needs mercury to work. Um, when they get captured in the Dalek City the first time, the Daleks take that thing, and then when they escape, they're like, oh, that thing is still in the city. We need that even though the doctor lied about it actually needing mercury, they actually need to go back now and get that thing. So that's why they're kind of locked in. You'll notice with a lot of these stories, they kind of need an excuse as to why they don't just leave. <laughs> so like, oh, we're in danger. Maybe we should just leave. No, there's, there's got to be some reason like they can't leave. For, for, for one reason or another, they have to stay around until... Most of the time, it's because they get captured and they get pulled away from the TARDIS and they have to work their way back to the TARDIS, or they get locked out of the TARDIS. Um, this is one of those, oh, we got locked out of the TARDIS sort of stories. I think in modern day Doctor Who, it's it's oftentimes like, oh, it, people are in danger and we have to save them. And that's the reason they don't leave is because they have to like do the right thing first and then leave but in these early episodes the doctor is like super apathetic <laughs> towards like life susan has a lot of compassion i will say but like the doctor it's his tardis and if he wants to leave he'll, he's just gonna leave so um they also do a lot of historicals early on and because of that like in the historicals it's like dang but they can't really change anything in history, right? So they should just leave. So they have to, like, really, really create some sort of uh, random nonsense that makes it so that they can't uh, they can't just leave. Anyways, the Daleks, uh, I kind of, you know, I covered all of the Daleks. It's a, it's actually a really good story. In, 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 in returning to it, I feel like it's, it's super well done, especially early on. I think the suspense of it is great. They don't really show the Daleks until... Um, you know, there, there's a really good cine, cinemographic, cinematograph effect, cine, cinemat massacre. Uh, and I, I think it's the episodes that are directed by Christopher Barry specifically. As the whole thing's written by Terry Nation, so that's seven episodes written by Terry Nation. But I think Christopher Barry does some really interesting stuff with, like, the the Daleks. There's, there's a part where, like, the camera is from the Daleks' perspective, and, like, Barbara's, like, up against the wall, and she's, like, screaming. Um, as the Dalek, like, approaches, and you only see its little, like, arm moving towards her as she gets captured. Some really, like, interesting shots, some really, like, iconic stuff like that, um, which really adds to the appeal of this serial. I also think just, the, like, the, the design of the Daleks is, like, it's simple enough, and, like, you know, it is what it is. Maybe it's not the scariest looking thing in the world, but, like, it, it works for what these creatures are. And they're scary enough just based on their, like, lack of caring about anything but themselves. Just a complete no sympathy towards any living thing other than the Daleks. Um, but I also like how they move. I think they move really interestingly. Like, I was kind of impressed with some of the motion of these creatures. Because it, it seems like maybe the machines that they were piloting weren't, like, like super bulky like sometimes they get like costumes for some of these creatures and it's like they're really like bulky and it's like awkward for them to move around so they're like kind of like sh shambling about whereas the daleks aren't they, they like move pretty smoothly pretty solidly um with direction like it, it like they have intention about what they're doing and where they're going most of the time so th there's a lot to like really like about this 
Um, there's an espe a scene I especially <laughs> liked, which I'm like, it must have taken them forever to get this perfect. But there's a scene where, like, there's a, a machine that's, like, printing out. It's almost like a, a receipt machine, I guess, that you would see at, like, a grocery store where it prints out, like, a thin sheet. Um, and they, like, one of the Daleks, like, picks up this sheet with it with its little, like, uh, plunger. And it's, like, just looking at the sheet. And then it, like, passes the sheet over to another Dalek, which also lifts it up with his plunger. And I'm like, damn! That I bet this was really hard to coordinate <laughs> these like machines that could probably barely like there's some dude in these machines and they can't see shit right <laughs> it's like that must be super hard to coordinate that sort of thing but I was like, really impressed with that I thought I was like damn they, they pulled it off they did a good job with that yeah I think also the voices of the Daleks the way they've got that robotic distortion on them early on is pretty is a nice touch but overall, they're ju they're just good villains. They're not stupid. They're pretty clever. They're pretty smart at what they do. Um, there are times where they kind of get the upper hand in a lot of ways. Oh, I wanted to mention, like, um, early on in the 60s when they were recording these, um, a big thing that's important to note is that they couldn't really do a lot of retakes or reshoots of certain scenes. Uh, because it would cost them an immense amount of money to redo a scene. <laughs> so oftentimes there would be mistakes. If they made a mistake and it was like minor and le they could like save the scene by like the actor just being like, oh, and here's my line, right? And they just like, they remember the line and they, they kind of fumble the line a little bit, but maybe they, they like ultimately get the line out properly. Um, they're going to keep that take in. Uh, so that's kind of, interesting but you'll you'll notice uh, if you watch a lot of this early doctor who that that happens a lot where an actor will kind of like fumble a line or like the delivery will be a l just slightly more awkward than you'd expect um hartnell especially he actually is kind of well known he's the first doctor he's quite well known for uh his 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 fumbling of of delivery of lines he does it more more so often than anybody else. He messes up lines, but it's kind of, it's pretty endearing, honestly. I kind of like that. He messes up lines quite a lot, um, but he'll get to it, and they'll they'll keep that taken, even if he as long as he gets ultimately the 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 idea expresses the line right. Like that's all that matters. Oh, I was trying to figure out what I wrote here. I wrote lock on Tardis melts if too many failures. Um, but I remember, okay, so it was because they actually, there's a line in this where they talk about how, like, they, they talk about, like, going back to the ship and, like, trying to unlock the TARDIS. Um, and I think it's Susan that mentions this. She says, like, if you try to unlock the TARDIS too many times and you, like, fail, like, only the doctor can unlock the TARDIS. Like, the lock will literally melt and then nobody will be able to <laughs> open the TARDIS. I just thought that was an interesting, like, little tidbit of lore. Oh yeah, the so the Daleks they require static electricity in this. There's a there's an ep, there's a part of an episode where they actually kill a Dalek um, by basically putting a carpet underneath it and pushing it onto the carpet, and that's this it like dies because of that. Um, the static electricity thing is kind of later removed, retcon not retcon, but like removed as like a thing that Daleks need for later episodes, just because it's such an easy exploit. It is established when they try to pull. They, there's like something. There's an entity inside of the Dalek shell, and so they uh, pull this like creature out, but they don't show what it is, which I think is really interesting. We never actually get to see what a Dalek looks like. Uh, but we do see a little bit of, like, a hand, I think, poking out from under the blanket when they throw it off to the side. Um, but at this stage, we don't really know what a Dalek looks like. I will say when they're in the swamp later on, there's, like, a weird creature that, like, pops out of the swamp that kind of looks like a Dalek, or at least are later interpretations of what Daleks look like, which are sort of like these weird-looking octopus creatures. <clears throat> so... I don't know if that was intentional. Probably not. <laughs> Probably just like that was a weird creature they were put in the swamp. But they just decided to make Daleks kind of look like that creature later on. So, Oh, and they do say the word exterminate in this. I, I thought they didn't. I thought like this is a catchphrase that's established later. They actually do. They talk about we, we will exterminate the 
life on the planet experiment like they do do that and uh yeah the only other thing i have here is uh, there's a couple other character moments uh for one the doctor messes up ian's last name a lot it seems he's doing it on purpose <laughs> uh like it's not even like in like it's in it's scripted that he's supposed to do that i guess and ian kind of hates that yeah i mean so early on they're not really given a lot of time to sort of breathe as a as a group but uh they go through a lot together in these first two episodes <laughs> um and as a family um they they're still very distrustful uh barbara and ian don't super love the doctor because he's kind of taken them away and put them in these dangerous situation and they're like well we want to get home really is our most is 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 what we want more than anything and the doctor just wants to like go and explore and he doesn't really care about them at all clearly he doesn't really care too much about keeping them super safe so there's a lot of tension there's a lot of tension in the tardis but that brings us to uh, the third serial we can finally move on from the daleks a third serial the edge of destruction which is also rather a good episode. I, I will say, like like I said, some of, the, some of the early episodes of this are like really, really good, really well done. Um, and this one's done by David Whitaker. It's not a, it's a it's a name we will definitely be uh, discussing later as well. Um, but this serial is only two episodes long, and it's basically it's, it's yeah, it won't take that long to cover. It's essentially um, the TARDIS. Something's going wrong. They're stuck on the TARDIS. It's an episode that takes place entirely on the TARDIS. Something's going wrong. What's going wrong? I don't know. Everybody's starting to act all crazy. Uh, everybody's getting all upset. And the Doctor starts to blame Ian and Barbara that they're, like, sabotaging his TARDIS uh, because they're mad about him not taking them home. And th this is, I think, the reason why I didn't, I initially really didn't like the first Doctor um was I, I i think how quick he was to like blame them for like something obviously they didn't do it doesn't even really make sense for them to like sabotage the tardis and kill like everybody's gonna die if that's the case and they're unwilling to admit it right and they're just like so stubborn about it that they're not gonna that they're willing to like die uh just to spite him like that's what he thinks i'm like that's insane like th th they, they did get kidnapped he kidnapped them like they're they're i'm more sympathetic to them than i am to him and then i can't remember if it's in this episode or a later episode i think it's a later episode actually where susan is like upset that they're they have this desire to leave to go home um but there's a weird aspect of this story that is like susan goes crazy and like almost stabs some, them with like scissors I don't really know what's going on with that whole thing. Because um, as it turns out, the whole reason that all this goes on um, is that they they there's a button that's called the fast return or the quick return button. And they press the quick return button to just return as fast as possible back to uh, a previous destination. And it got stuck. And that's why things have been going all getting all messed up, and that's why they were literally about to be destroyed because it got the quick return button got stuck. Ultimately, kind of dumb, but <laughs> kind of funny also. And uh, I don't know. It was just a. It's a nice. It was a nice uh, bonding experience, I guess, for the characters. It was nice to establish just their dynamic with each other and like how they're feeling, like tensions rising and kind of collapsing <laughs> under themselves that they're all very distrustful of each other they don't really particularly like each other the doctor and susan trust each other ian and barbara trust each other but those two groups don't trust each other and yeah as it turns out ian and barbara did nothing wrong the doctor and susan didn't really do anything wrong and at the end of this the doctor is willing to admit that he uh you know, was kind of being shitty at the end, which I do like. Um, but that brings us to Marco Polo, Serial 4. Uh, man, this one's written by John Lucarotti, who also wrote uh, later on uh, The Aztecs, which we'll get to. That's Serial 6. Um, 
here's the thing about Marco Polo. A lot of firsts with Marco Polo. Marco Polo is the first serial that has missing episodes. And not only is that the case, but it's entirely missing. <laughs> it's the first serial that is entirely missing. It is seven episodes long, and it is missing. So this is kind of... I feel like Marco Polo is the first like really hurt, real hurdle of like watching classic Doctor Who. Um... <clears throat> Because you'll probably get to it and you'll be like, hmm, do I skip this and just watch what's what's there? And like, yeah, you might do that and you can do that. You could just skip Marco Polo, I guess. It's not like the most important serial. Um, but you'll find that later on, there's a lot of serials that are missing that are much more, much bigger stories. Like, for example... Um, there's a lot of Dalek stories. The Daleks Master Plan is a big one that's in Season 3. And that's majority missing. And it's like, I don't know, like 20 episodes. It's, it's a lot of episodes. Um, it, it was one of the more ambitious uh, Dalek stories. And that's Season 3. So are you going to skip that whole story? Um, and then there's one of the big ones, the 10th Planet. The 10th Planet is almost... Or, sorry, no, just the last episode of the 10th Planet is missing. But the 10th planet is important because it's the serial in which the first Doctor regenerates into the second. It's the first regeneration episode. Um, it's the first Doctor's final episode. And the final episode of it is missing. It's one of the most sought-after episodes of Doctor Who in existence. Probably the most valuable if somebody could find it. Like, that's, that's a big deal. Because people really want that one. Um, but, like, do you skip the 10th planet? Do you skip that one? I don't know. So, it's a whole thing. If you go on, like... Okay, I watched all, all of these on Amazon for the most part. Um, and Amazon only includes a serial if it is completely accounted for. If they have every single episode in that serial, they'll put it on Amazon. And, like, Doctor Who Classic Season 1, they'll put it there. If it is missing one or any amount of episodes, they completely just throw the serial out it's not included right so for example um marco polo is a bad example because all of the episodes are missing but uh the the last serial in this in this season is the reign of terror which only has two missing episodes out of uh six so it's got four out of six episodes the first three and then it's missing four and five and then uh episode six we do have um <clears throat> they completely threw that episode out. It's you can't watch any part of it on Amazon Classic C season one. It doesn't even skip the just skip the two episodes that are missing. It skips the entirety of it. So I think that's a weird decision, a weird choice that they do, but it is what they do. Um, so I'm not a big fan of that. So you kind of have to like find other ways to like watch the episodes, and even if the episode is not actually missing, even if it's just an episode that exists of a serial that has episodes missing. You have to like go out of your way to find some like outward way to watch it. That's really dumb. Um, and then some of the missing serials also have recreations that they've been working on. In my opinion, not fast enough. <laughs> I feel like they should have most of these done. There's still quite a few that are missing. The next one they're doing is Celestial Toy Maker from season three just because they brought that character back in, in the modern Doctor Who. They're like, oh, people will want to watch this now. But it's like, it's going to take them way too long to make it. But, <laughs> but the point at which they release it, it's like nobody's going to care anymore. It's like the, the hype of that is completely uh, wasted. But I don't know. There's still a few, and I'm, I'm waiting for the day in which they all have a recreation. But... Um, like I said, Marco Polo is the first episode, or the first serial that has missing episodes, and it's the first serial that's entirely missing, and it also does not have a recreation at this point, or an animation. Um, <sighs> yeah. So, is what it is. I don't know when they're gonna get their shit together and make a Marco Polo recreation. I guess I should explain the reason why there are missing episodes of Doctor Who, so 
Doctor Who first aired in the 60s, 63 and 64, and it aired on BBC. Um, and normally the way that they do this is that they, you know, they have the episode on like tapes and then they send the tapes out to various different stations and then they air the episode. And then at that point, they're like done. That's it. At, at the time, they really didn't think that like they would need to preserve the episode or that anybody would care about these episodes in the future. Um, they didn't really know about how successful this thing would be years and years and years down the line. And it's almost like, I think in the same way you could think of like a radio play, where it's like, how many times did like somebody air something on the radio and then that thing is just completely lost and nobody really thinks about it, right? You know, it's like it aired once and it's just completely never aired again, <laughs> you know? And it's just like nobody has a recording of that thing. It's kind of like a similar thing. I guess they thought of it the same way. But television has kind of lasted the test of time, and it's gotten to the point where, you know, shows from back then, like Doctor Who, is kind of the seminal example, is just a show that continues to be popular to this day, but now has episodes where back then they didn't know the show was going to be as popular as it was and didn't know it was going to last 60 years. Um, and so they had tapes of episodes, and they were just like, they would either just throw them away or... Um, tape over them, and then the episode would just kind of be lost forever. So there's a hunt for a lot of these to be um, to be found, and there's a couple different ways that they find them, and they have found them, some of them. Um, one is through personal collections of anybody that, like, you know, was around when the show was airing and maybe recorded it themselves on their on their TV sets. Um, the other is, like I said, they would send them internationally. They would send out international tapes. And if any of those, they could, you know, reclaim any of those from other stations. Um, then they would also have a, a copy of the episode. <laughs> but there's still plenty of episodes that are missing. And it is what it is, but that's that's just the, the tall and short of it. Um, luckily, it's only the first and second Doctor eras. And weirdly enough, I think there's more second Doctor episodes missing than first Doctor episodes. I don't know why that is. It just is that way. Um, but uh, it, it, and especially in the first and second season, we actually have a lot more of those episodes than we do like the third and fourth seasons. Um, through to the sixth seasons, it's really weird. I don't, I don't know how to explain that, but it is what it is. Anyways, like I said, Marco Polo is a hurdle. If you choose to watch it, there are ways to kind of watch it. Um, you know, back in the day when I was first trying to sit through classic Doctor Who, uh, I tried a couple different things. So one of the ways you can watch it, basically they do have the audio recordings for whatever reason, but they sound like they're at a distance. Like somebody was like, you know, recording something on their phone. Obviously, it's not what they were doing, but it sounds like they're recording from like a distance. It's not like the the main like... Uh, mix that they would use in the actual episode but um, they have that and then they have like camera stills which was just like throughout recording of an episode they would like take pictures um, throughout the episodes so they just have like these random pictures of like scenes and so there's people who have gone through and like recreated the episode by using these stills with this like kind of shitty audio um, I don't know who put all these together, but somebody did. Somebody went to that effort and probably deserves a lot of credit for doing that. Because, like, wow, that's nice of you to do that. It's just so there is a, like, format to watch these episodes in, kind of. Um, the other way you can do it is, like, most of these scripts are available. Like, you could read through the script if you really wanted to. There's also novelizations of some of these that you could just read. Um, I choose to watch the reconstruction of the episode with the shitty stills and the shitty audio that's the way i usually watch it unless there's an animation that exists i'll watch that i think that's just the best way for me personally but i will say it's tough um like i said this is seven episodes um and they're all like 24 25 minute long episodes 26 minute episodes so that's like you know three and a half hours if i did the math right <laughs> it's almost three and a half hours of, like, sitting through, that's, like, way more than movie length, and you're sitting through watching these, like, 
stills of like nothing really happening there's a lot of moments where there's like nothing happening and there's like text on the bottom of the screen like describing what's happening it is ah it is so hard to watch to watch through this it is really tough um and i don't love it but i did do it i did rewatch it again marco polo and it's the as a it's the first historical story it's fine they go basically they arrive in like the time of marco polo and they get their like caravan the tardis they get it captured by marco polo and then he doesn't want to like give it like he wants to give it to kublai khan as like a gift so that he can like go home like his like his kublai he does too too good a job uh that they the kublai khan the khan won't let him go home and so he's like well if i give them this thing they'll let me go home and so that's that's the whole crux of the issue the whole reason that the uh the doctor and his companions are stuck in marco polo times is because marco polo wants to give the tardis as a gift and they can't like just get it in and leave um meanwhile they uncover this whole plot about this this guy um who's planning to like attack uh the kublai khan who's setting up there they've got this army that's coming in and he's like working under the radar to uh like work with his armies they're gonna overthrow the kublai khan um and they're ultimately they're foiled obviously at the end of this uh and the doctor ends up winning back the tardis the tardis is gifted to the kublai khan but uh the uh the doctor basically befriends the kublai they bond over like how old and decrepit they are they're like oh i'm old and my bones creak and it's nice to talk to someone whose knees are also broken you know and then they play like uh backgammon they play backgammon together and the doctor is able to win the tardis back in a game of backgammon and then they leave it's quite honestly kind of a cute series of episodes when i describe it i think the way that i did <laughs> you know i kind of like a, succinctly i, ki- I kind of liked it but at the same time it's too long <laughs> it's like it's seven episodes long um and each one is like an individual like little adventure uh the roof of the world is the first episode which is like them on top of the mountain um <clears throat> called the the roof of the world the singing sands is them like out in the desert they go out in the desert and then as the they get caught in a sandstorm and the sandstorm is like there's like it's kind of sounds like it's singing there's like a lot of noise to it uh 500 eyes is like there's like a story i think one of the 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 girl i think her name is like ping cho or something she like tells a story about like a tomb and it's also a tomb where like they're they meet it's a this part of this story i don't know it's some sort of cave and it's like where the meetings going on and then they go they go there um i did want to mention i think um we'll talk about it later we'll talk about it later i can talk about yeah we'll talk about the characters later i want i want to talk about the development of ian and barbara and susan um i guess i can kind of talk about it here i feel like specifically barbara i didn't like her character so much in the early episodes because i felt like especially in marco polo and before um she has this kind of quality to her where like she if it seems like she's constantly on the verge of like a nervous breakdown she's constantly like screaming and fainting and like overreacting to like everything and it's like holy crap this 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 woman is like she her she's not mentally sound she's she's gonna have a nervous breakdown at any moment here like i i don't know um and then at some point and i think it's like the aztecs it's like into it's like the keys of marinus into like the aztecs her character like com, like totally 180s and completely improves to the point where she's like actually a character and actually like normal and uh cool and i actually like her um but i I will also say that susan on the other hand 
Um, it's kind of excusable that she's a little bit more, you know, she's a she's a child. She's, Susan is like 15 in these episodes. Um, and she d- has a lot of moments where she just screams really loud and, like, is crying and freaking out. And it's like, I forgive her because she's like, she's supposed to be like 15 in this, right? I forgive her for that. So I'm like, okay, she's kind of allowed to just like freak out and be scared of everything. But uh, it's a little too loud sometimes, but it's okay, fine. <laughs> uh, Barbara doing it, I was a little less uh, sympathetic towards though. <laughs> so she, she gets better. Anyways, I wanted to just bring that up. We'll talk more about the characters like later. Uh, that's essentially Marco Polo. One of the things, uh, okay, so we'll move on to Serial 5, which is The Keys of Marinus. Um, The Keys of Marinus is an extremely ambitious (laughs) episode, for sure. Um, very complex. One of the things I just, I do want to, want to sort of, um, bring up, I guess, is the fact that, like, Ian keeps his, like, costume, his, like, Chinese outfit into The Keys of Marinus. So he's, like, wearing it at the beginning of that. And I just kind of like those little details, that little touch of like cohesiveness between like episodes of him, of, of characters like continuing to wear the, the same outfit into the next like serials, just kind of a fun little touch. I don't know. That's all I wanted to say about it. Um, there's another, uh, like um, Barbara also in the edge of destruction. She wears the, the, those like pants that she gets from the talls and, in the Daleks, so yeah. Anyways, oh, I did want to mention. So, Edge of Destruction. I talked about this in uh, one of my other episodes. I can't remember which one, but in Edge of Destruction, they mentioned the planet Kenus. Um, <clears throat> basically, the TARDIS is like shows a bunch of things, uh, and they're like, "Oh, these are our past adventures." The doc, the the TARDIS is trying to explain something to us. They also kind of like define that the TARDIS is like somewhat sentient. Or at least as a machine, it has the capacity to, like, communicate. Which is really interesting as, like, an early established plot point. Um, but, like, yeah, they mentioned the planet Kenus. They mentioned a bunch of, like... They basically established that there's all these adventures that are happening that we don't really see. Um, which is kind of fun. It's a fun concept to note. Especially doing what, our, what we're doing with the uh, extended episodes, right? Extended uh, media, extended war. But I wanted to mention, I can't, I don't know, I don't think I properly wrote the note down. But it was either the Keys of Marinus or the Aztecs where, like, in the beginning, the Doctor mentions having met Hercule Poirot. Oh, you know what it was? It's probably the end of the Keys of Marinus. I bet that's what it is. It's probably, like, the, the, yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) Because he acts as a detective in this serial at that point. And he talks about, like, oh, uh, he talks about, oh, don't you know the the things, the, the Poirot? Uh, and Ian's like, oh, it's great that you read literature. And uh, the doctor's like, literature? I read? I met the man. Which is interesting because Hercule Poirot is not a real person, as far as I know. He's, <laughs> he's uh, you know, he's part of the mystery novels uh, written by Agatha Christie. He's a detective and then in Agatha Christie novels, so I don't know what... That's kind of an interesting note. He says Hercule Poirot is real and that the Doctor met him. This is canon, I guess, but... Anyways, The Keys of Marinus, super complex. This is another Terry Nation story, obviously the same writer as the Daleks, but this one's way more ambitious. And I, I mentioned this before that, like, I think they wanted the Vord... Um, who are sort of the villains of this episode to be just as popular as the Daleks. I think they kind of anticipated that possibly being the case. And it seems to me like it's very clear why they weren't. Uh, For one, they're only in the first and last episode of this serial. And for two, in the very first episode, they're mostly pretty quickly and easily foiled. They're just not established to be as as scary. Um, They're not really established to be super smart, or anything they're just kind of villains they're just kind of villains i like their design they've kind of got this like almost scuba diver outfit with these like weird helmets with these like large ears and uh it's almost like 
Man, I was gonna talk about like Dura Ra Ra. Have you guys seen that? Where it's got like the uh, what's her name? Silk, silky, silty, silty. Who's like the? Uh, she's like a ghost woman, and she wears like a biker outfit with like a wolf helmet. With like a helmet that's like covers her entire head because she doesn't have a head. Uh, <laughs> this is like a really out there reference, but it's kind of like that. It reminds me a little bit of that, but the like the 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 ears are like kind of huge rings and their feet are like flippers um the design is cool it's just they're not established to be nearly as like threatening i guess because they're pretty easily foiled um and they're not even like the main source of conflict in the episode so or the serial the main the main reason i say this is really ambitious okay and let me describe to you this f freaking story okay um, basically, Marinus, as a planet, uh, they used to have this machine, and this machine basically would, um, influence people's brains to remove, uh, their ability to commit anything that might be committed, considered like a crime. So, it removes any tendency towards violence or thievery or anything bad at all that would be illegal. And so... They were able to create world peace by creating this machine, um, and everything was great on, on Marinus for a really long time until the Vord appeared, and the Vord uh, essentially were able to somehow override this, um, and they were able to commit violence, they were able to steal, and nobody could really stop them because the machine eliminated anybody's ability to sort of defend themselves because they would have to be committing violence in order to defend themselves against the board. Fast forward many, many, many years later on the planet Marinus, uh, they disable this machine and give everybody the ability to do whatever they want again. Um, and they take uh, five keys from the machine and they spread them throughout the planet. It's very video gamey, right? Um, one of the keys actually, sorry, one of the keys they leave in the machine. So it's just four keys that they spread out throughout the planet and yeah so the vord um are now trying to attack this machine they're trying to take control of this machine because they believe if they take control of the machine they can force anybody to do whatever they want they have control over people's free will i suppose um the doctor and his team arrive basically at that same point at which the vord are attacking and uh they foil the Vord in a lot of ways. They kind of haphazardly just stop them, and uh, you know, accidentally for the most part. Um, but when they hear this uh, story from Abaddon, I think his name is old man who lives in this giant skyscraper where this machine is kept by himself. Um, they meet him. He explains the situation, and they're like, "Well, we don't really want to help you." And then they try to leave. And then this, the guy doesn't, like, let them leave. He puts a force field around the TARDIS so they can't leave. And then they have to help. And he gives them these cool little teleporter wristbands. And then they, they, they teleport off to uh, their next destination to pick up each one of the keys. Now, everything that I just said is the first episode of this serial, okay? So that's why I'm saying this is, like, a very... It's a super ambitious serial <laughs> because... Um, they treat Marinus as a very, like, large and varied planet. Like, there's a lot of different things going on. So, in the second episode, they go to, like, a mansion that's almost, like, Roman in design. Um, in the second episode, they go to, like, a South American jungle. In the third episode, they go to, like, a snowy mountain. Um, the fourth episode is kind of like a, I don't know, like a military base in a lot of ways. Um, and then ultimately back to the skyscraper. So each episode is kind of like a different, like smaller story within the larger narrative. It's pretty wild. Um, it's a pretty impressive series of episodes. Okay, so I guess we'll we'll try to cover them individually. Um, so the first episode, the Velvet Web. Um, basically, Barbara goes first. Um, I, I do like the touch of them not initially agreeing to help because they don't really like the idea of this machine. I don't like the idea of the machine either. I thought it's like kind of a morally shitty thing, and I'm glad the episode acknowledges that. I think it's kind of part of the point of the episode of the serial overall. 
Yeah, so the 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 second episode, they go to uh, like a Roman mansion. Barbara goes first, and uh, she's kind of treated like a queen, like a princess. They they basically give her a bunch of food, and they're like, "Whatever you want, you can have." And they get this mansion, and they all arrive. And at first, they're kind of skeptical, and then they're like, "Oh, well, what do you want? We'll give it to you." And then they start giving them things that they ask for, um, and it turns out that uh, upon their first night of sleeping there, um, Barbara's, like, brain hip, hip, hypnosis thing um, ends up failing, like it falls off her head. They're, they're being hypnotized. And so she's able to suddenly, in the next morning, see everything for what it is, and she sees that this mansion is actually, like, in tatters and falling apart, and all of the things that, uh, like, Susan got this nice dress, but it's actually not a real. And it's in tatters. It's falling apart. Um, they, they gave the doctor a laboratory, and his all of his stuff is actually just broken instruments. So she's the first that's able to see through the illusion. And at first, everyone thinks she's kind of crazy. But uh, then she's uh, able to find out that what's really happening here is that this... Uh, mansion is run by these sort of alien slug creatures maybe not aliens i they might might be native to marinus they're like slug creatures and she starts bashing their machines and destroys them and uh saves everybody which is great so this is a this is a big episode for barbara she gets to be the hero of this episode um which is why i say i feel like from Keys of Marinus onwards, she's she she kind of turns around as a character. She becomes very uh, powerful and heroic, um, and this is kind of the start of that. I feel like she's 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 like she takes control. She's no longer like s- scared and screaming all the time. She's like, oh, here's the problem. I can fix this problem, and then she fixes it. It's pretty, it's pretty poggers. The screaming jungle. Like I said, they go to uh, this is episode three. They go to like a jungle. And first, they find a key. Oh, there's a bunch of stuff I missed in the second episode. Sorry. Um, Abaddon. I don't even think that's his name. Hold on. Let me look up his actual name. Arbaton. I was really close. Arbaton. Okay. Yeah, Arbaton. He's got basically a servant and his daughter. And he, he mentions in the first episode how he sent them ahead. Um, as well as, a, uh, I believe, a third guy that they sent further ahead as well um so two servants two servants and his daughter um one of the servants whose name because i'm on the page i know it altos uh and sabitha the daughter um are basically like they they were also brainwashed in the mansion in the second episode so um they're able to reconnoiter (laughs) reconnect with these two uh and they join the um they join the the adventure, I suppose. So what happens in uh, Velvet Web is the f- the four of them, that is Alto, Sabitha, Susan, uh, it's five of them actually, Barbara and Ian, um, all go ahead to the South American place. The doctor explains that he's going to go on several <clears throat> clicks ahead he's gonna go like he's gonna go oh, i'm gonna go a little bit further ahead to scout out the area and so it's kind of funny because the doctor is not in the next two episodes <laughs> despite the show being named after him he uh he's not in episode three and four basically the reason for this is because like when they actually were like writing and acting and directing these episodes at least as far as i know it was because the actors sometimes would take vacations and so, like, they'd be like, oh, well, you're just not, I'm just not going to be in these episodes. And they would just be written out of a couple episodes and then come back. Sounds kind of crazy now to, like, have your title character just be like, oh, I'm just going to take a vacation. And then they just, like, like, all right, we'll just write you out of the next two episodes, like, the title character. Like, okay. Um, but anyways, they go to a South American jungle. And uh, they get this fake key, which originally they think is real. But it's not. Um, But then Altos and Sabitha and Susan uh, decide to go to the next destination. Well, Altos and Susan decide to go to the next um, destination. And uh, Sabitha realizes just before she's about to go that the key is not real. 
And so she gives it back to Ian. She's like, this isn't real. And he's like, oh, well, I guess we'll just have to go find the real one. And so Sabitha leaves. And so it's just Ian and Barbara for the rest of the episode. Uh, they Barbara gets stuck in this trap. And then there's this old man who's basically like, there's these vines. like what? A, it's a crazy episode. What a weird episode this is. There's this like temple. And like these vines are like growing all over it. And then they attack the old man. And then he gets killed. Uh, but not before he like they're able to like escape. Um, and then he gives them a message that's like, here's where the key is hidden. And they find out it's like a chemical jar. And then they find the key in the chemical jar and then they leave. It's a weird episode. The Snows of Terror is also a weird episode. They get uh, sent to the mountains. Uh, Ian and Barbara arrive later than the other three. So um, they're about to like die of frostbite out in the mountains. And then this guy comes and brings him to their cabin. And then he kind of like, uh, just kind of like is a scummy jerk where he like, he knows where the others are, but he won't like tell them unless they give him something. And so he gives them like his bracelet. Ian gives them the, the like teleportation bracelet. I believe in exchange for knowledge about where Sabitha and like, uh, Susan are and they're in like a cave and then they go to the cave and then they find them in the cave and then they get it they find the key and it's like in a block of ice and then they have to turn some dials to like make hot water melt the ice but then there's these statues of like uh, dudes like knights in armor and the knights in armor get melted and then start chasing them and then they like they go they run across a bridge and then they break the bridge so that one of the knights falls into like the abyss and then they run back to the cabin, uh, and the weird, creepy guy uh, that's there um, takes Susan hostage, but then the, the knights followed them, and then they stab the dude through the door, and then they all take their little trinkets and their little stuff back, and then they teleport to the next locations, and that's the Snows of Terror. What a weird episode. <laughs> I, I do think about a lot, like, how the night, what, what was going on with those weird knights, it was like they were mechanical robots or something that were just like uh, programmed to just follow whoever took the key. Like they never really resolved that issue. And it's like, okay, well, do they like hone in on like as soon as they teleport, are they going to like try to follow them like across the sea? You know, like <laughs> like it's like an it follows situation where like no matter where they go, these these soldiers are always going to be like trying to follow them, <laughs> trying to get there. Uh, like, they're gonna get on a rocket ship and, like, you know what I mean, if they go into space. So the last one, and I, I do, I really like the Keys of Marinus, okay? I do think it's, like, really interesting, really well done. And I like the idea when you have, like, a planet in sci-fi, a lot of the time, the normal trap that people fall into is that they make the planet, like, one thing. It's, like, one biome, right? Like, Tatooine in Star Wars is, like, the desert planet, Right? And like Nab, uh, sorry, not Naboo, uh, Coruscant <laughs> in Star Wars. I'm a, I'm kind of a Star Wars dork as well as Doctor Who dork. But Coruscant, what do you think when you think of Coruscant? It's just the city planet. It's just a planet that has the city in it. And then you can might also think of like the undercity area that they go into in one of the movies. But like that's, it's the planet with the city in the clouds. It's like, no, planets are huge, right? We have, you have Earth, and it's like, think about how different, like, South America is from, like, Antarctica is different from, like, Egypt is different from, like, you know, Iceland is different from Australia is different from fucking Texas, California, uh, France. It's like, planet Earth is super varied. And, in fact, all of the ideas that we could possibly have for, like, a planet mostly come from... The, just the earth the one planet that we know right so it's like yeah most planets would be like this so it's kind of cool to see a sci-fi you know story actually go this route of making a planet that is more complex than just like it's the desert planet right um so the sentence of death is like i i feel like the best way to describe it is like kind of a military base um they have one of the keys but it's like it's like a heist. It's like locked in a safe. And unfortunately, Ian 
happens to teleport directly into the safe and um, is blamed for basically like the mur this murder <laughs> that, that occurs. Like somebody has murdered this, this other person and then waxy and on the head and then sort of uh, frames him for the crime while escaping with the key. So all of a sudden it's this like who done it sort of mystery um trial sort of episode where like Ian's on trial um the doctor is like representing him the doctor comes back in this episode this is the spot which he decided to go ahead to so he was already he's already been here for a while and so he's got to solve this mystery and he's got to defend Ian in the trial turns out that uh I guess oh, can't even really remember it was like one of the guards Oh, it was like, yeah, so it was somebody that was supposed to take over guard duty Um, that, like, bashes, yeah, no, it's somebody that let, oh, yeah, they take over guard duty, and they're the first on the scene to, like, report the crime. They're the ones that reported the crime in the first place, right, because they discovered it because they were supposed to take over, but they planned on stealing the key themselves anyways. Which the whole reason they wanted to steal the key is kind of arbitrary in the first place. It's cause, just because, like, the key is worth a lot or something. They're like, I guess we're, they were going to try to sell the key. But even then, it's like, everybody would know what the key was if you tried to sell it, right? It'd just be like, okay, this is something illegal that you probably stole, like, for sure. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, then that guy offs himself. Um, then it turns out that his wife was, like, in on it. And then the... Yeah, uh, they they catch them by basically staging this whole thing where they knew. Doctor figures out that the key is probably inside the murder weapon because they couldn't have left the thing with it. So they find the guy that's coming back to steal the murder weapon, and then they catch him in the act, and then everybody's golden, and then they can leave. So, like I said, a bunch of different stories going on in Keys of Marinus. It's, it's a pretty fun story overall. I quite like it. But when they get back to uh, the temple from the beginning, the skyscraper from the beginning, if you remember, they were sent out. Each of these episodes, they got a key, okay? And they're supposed to, like, re restore this machine. Um, but by the time they get there, uh, the Vord have taken over. And actually, we already know this by the end of the first episode. Last thing we see is Arbitan getting approached and attacked by a Vord. So we know that the Vord took over. Um, and they end up just tricking the Vord by basically giving them a fake key, which ends up blowing up the machine, and, uh, thus everything works out a-okay. <laughs> um, I m might have honestly preferred this episode if, like, they had to deal with sort of the moral conundrum of, like, restoring this machine themselves, but, like, the decision is kind of taken entirely from them. Which I think is kind of, uh, you know, whatever. It doesn't really... I, I feel like it takes away from the moral... if I don't know. The moral explanation of it. Exploration of it, I should say. Where it's like, oh, well, this is the solution that we just kind of happened. It's just kind of convenient that that's ha what happened with it. But, you know, whatever. But yeah, for as for the Vord being nearly as popular as the Daleks, this episode... Like, the serial was, like, good. It was well written. It was well put together. It was fun, but the Vord were just not the the centerpiece of it. They were just there. They were just the enemy that just kind of, like, had to exist <laughs> for the plot to happen, I guess. And that's kind of why I don't feel like they, you know, were going to take off nearly as much as the Daleks. Whereas with the Daleks, the Daleks were incredibly central to the story of the Daleks serial. Anyway, moving on. We have uh, The Aztecs, written by John Lucarati again. Uh, John Lucarati, who also wrote Marco Polo. He also did The, the, the Aztecs. He does the uh, um, two, I guess, of the three historicals of this season. Um, I will say The Aztecs is quite good, though. Um, and The Aztecs essentially... And I hate to say this, but as, like, a millennial, I kind of have to say it. It's basically just 
the road to El Dorado. If you've ever seen the road to El Dorado, it's like exactly the same story. <laughs> um, so they show up to Aztec times and Barbara as a history teacher knows a lot about Aztec. In fact, it's her favorite um, period of time for some reason. Uh, she was most fascinated with the Aztecs. So she knows way too much about the Aztecs. When she comes out of this temple, which is where the TARDIS ends up, it ends up inside this temple. And they come out of this temple, and the Aztecs are like, oh my gosh, people aren't allowed to go into the temple. Um, and because of like her knowledge of the Aztecs, uh, she's able to convince them that she is a goddess. So this is the first story in all of Doctor Who where the question is brought up of, like, can you ch change time or should you change time? Obviously, when you have a show about time travel, this is kind of a central plot point. It's like, well, should we go back in time? If, if I have a time machine, why shouldn't I go back in time and, like, kill Hitler or something, you know? It's a question that always comes up, right, when you're talking about time travel. And I think the Aztecs is the first time they try to sort of, like, touch on that idea. Um, whereas Barbara knows that the Aztecs are kind of doomed. She knows a lot of things about the Aztecs. She knows they sacrifice people um, just for, like, good weather and shit. And she's like, I'm going to change all of the bad aspects of Aztec society and hopefully uh, uh, fix them. Um, and the doctor, like, explains to her that it's seemingly not that, like, she shouldn't change time, but that she physically can't. That if she tries to, like, everything will still happen just as it was going to anyways. Like, she, as much as she might try, she can't change time. Which is an interesting sort of uh, approach to this whole thing. Which I don't think is, is like, how this works throughout the show 100% of the time. I feel like in later seasons, it does become, like, if you try to change time, like, you'll create a lot of, like, issues. Um, there's been a lot of, like, different explanations of this. There were, like, weird bat creatures that would come and try to kill you if you tried to change time. <laughs> um, and there was another plot point where there was, like, cracks. Like, you'd create cracks in the, like, fabric of the universe if you tried to change time. I feel like there's a bunch of different things that Doctor Who has tried to do with time changing it is rather interesting um in that part part of the problem when you think about this you only really think about changing time in in terms of like history and like what's already happened but from your own perspective but like when you think about stuff like the daleks it's like you know uh for that society these four were involved in a very significant like point in time <laughs> for that civilization wouldn't you say like oh they go and they foil like the daleks are going to like destroy this blow up this neutron bomb and like they stop them and if they weren't there would that would the talls still have stopped them i guess that's the question isn't it but like isn't that still a significant part of their history you know technically to the future of that moment would still be the history it's like, are they changing things in that context? You know? And it's usually that we talk about these things in the context of histories, I guess. But, like, the Keys of Marinus, they had a pretty central role in, like, the future of that planet. I don't know. It just makes it so that these historical stories, oftentimes, they're kind of, like, strung along for a lot of them, I feel like. Well, they can't really, like, actively participate too much. Um, they can be present, but they can't really affect the story <laughs> too much, which I feel like is partly why maybe the historicals are not nearly as good most of the time. Um, I think with the Aztecs, the thing about it is, like, it, there's not, like, a specific historical moment they're, they're portraying here so much as, like, they are in Marco Polo, and they are in, like, this eighth serial, The Reign of Terror, um... In the Aztecs, it's just un the it's just the Aztecs and like they're doing sacrifices and it's like you can do as much as you want with that, um, in terms of individual characters and like you know, it's not really like set in stone historical events that we're talking about here. This is really Barbara's episode. This is her time to shine. She she kind of takes control. She takes the reins. 
Um, she's treated as a queen, and she's like, oh, screw all you guys. I'm going to change the Aztecs. I don't care what the doctor says. He can't stop me. I'm going to I'm gonna do what I think is the right thing to do in this moment. And it's pretty, it's pretty well done. I think it's really good because um, she gets to kind of learn this lesson that no matter what she might do, she can't really change history, that it's just not an option that's available to her. Um, and part of the reason, I kind of like how they also just establish that, where it's like they have the one, um, the one guy that's willing to listen to her, but it's only because he believes her to be a goddess, and he even says at one point that like, if she, if he, if he finds out that she's been lying to him this whole time, like he's just gonna complete one eighty, like yeah, <laughs> you know, he's just going to believe in the sacrifices and believe in everything. He's like, you know, at first he's like, if you as a goddess tell me that the sacrifices are wrong, then. I'll believe you, but if you're not a goddess, then obviously I have no reason to believe you, so I'm going to continue to believe in the sacrifices, but he's willing to change, I guess, is the point, but even, but later on, I think Ian and uh, Barbara have, like, a conversation, and Ian mentions, like, yeah, that guy, like, you got through to him, and you can change him, but, like, the rest of the society, you, you don't understand, they're not going to change their minds, this is just how things are. Um, you really don't have the ability to um, just change the minds of this entire society when they believe things are one specific way, which I feel is a very interesting like perspective. It's a very interesting way to look at this whole thing. It's like how difficult it is to change the minds of an entire society. So as much as like Marco Polo is kind of like a, a drag for me, um, it's written by the same guy that did the Aztecs. I think the Aztecs is a much more is a much better story, and maybe I would have liked Marco Polo if it didn't if the episodes weren't all like I didn't have to watch them in the format that I did. They weren't missing episodes. The Aztecs is strong. The Aztecs is powerful. Good episode. Um, I also like the uh, the priest of sacrifice. Um, kind of again, Road to El Dorado comparison. He's very much like the villain of Road to El Dorado, but like the thing is. Is, is he, like, actually a bad guy in this story? I was thinking about this, and I'm like, I don't think he is. I don't think he, like, inherently does anything wrong. Like, he just leads the sacrifice of the society. It's like, I guess you could make the argument that he kind of, like, the society itself knows that the weather is going to be okay. And it's like, the priest of sacrifice and the, the high elder, or whatever the guy is, um both kind of like anticipate that like yeah we know how to measure these things and we like we know like it's gonna thunder tomorrow and that's why we can do this sacrifice on a day when it's gonna thunder and it's gonna you know we can predict all these things it's like they have the science to do it but like they genuinely believe that like if they don't do the sacrifice that even if they predict this thing that it's not it won't happen even though they predicted that they know it's gonna happen if they don't do the sacrifice it won't it's really weird, um, but I liked I liked the explanation of the sort of mindset where it's like, it does that make them truly evil? I don't think so because <laughs> they truly just believe the things they like. They're they're representatives of the society itself. Even though he's a priest of sacrifice and he leads the sacrifices, it is like the society itself that believes the sacrifices are necessary. You know. It's not like it's he, he, it, <laughs> he's like forcing the society, forcing this to happen. You know, he's not like a dictator or like anything like that. And he's also right for a good majority of this. Where like the whole conflict is him trying to prove that Barbara's not a goddess, which he's right about. She's not. She is lying. <laughs> She's not a goddess. I don't know. It's a. It, it's honestly the Aztecs was pretty fun. So I mean, so far, I will say my favorites. I've liked a lot of these episodes. Uh, Marco Polo is the only one where I'm like, kind of like, uh, it was just t a little too long and it was hard to watch it in the format that I did, but all of the rest of them, I quite, oh, and Un Unearthly Child, like the first, like episodes two to four of that, I, I don't care for it too much. 
Um, the Daleks is a little too long, I feel like, in length, like I said. Um, the Edge of Destruction is fine for what it is. Um, it's two episodes, and it's kind of an interesting little, like, ex- exploration of the, the dynamics of the characters and their um, dealing with, uh, you know, disaster. Uh, the Keys of Marinus is wild. Like, the best way I can put that is it's ambitious. It's incredibly ambitious for this show. It, it, like, they, like, Terry Nation tried to do something crazy. It's like he, he wanted to really write sci-fi, I think. And he's really good at writing sci-fi. But he do- does it in the context of the show to the point where it's like, damn, like, if you if you had written this outside of the show, like, it might be remembered as like one of the most famous you know one of the more famous like sci-fi adventure novels of of fantasy novels of like all time you know (laughs) so interesting to think about you know i guess it's like hmm how big might he have been if if these weren't like in the context of doctor who i don't know but then again i mean the the daleks by itself and the way I've, I've explained this before. The way British copyright works is, like, he owns every character he writes within the context of the show. So he, he was able to do whatever he wanted with the Daleks after the fact and the Ford. Anyways, Aztecs, Aztecs is also really good. And that one's only four episodes. Um, another thing I wanted to mention about this, though, was the, uh, uh, the, the Doctor actually has his first romance in, in the entire, entirety of the show. In the Aztecs, he's his first romance with a uh, an older Aztec woman, um, and they get like engaged to be married. Although the doctor doesn't know that's what's happening, um, he mistakenly sort of participates in this thing and then just kind of goes along with it. But then, by the end of the episode, he decides he talks with her. It's it's kind of cute where he like says he just has to leave and like he can't stay. Uh. But I, he he never really admits that it was a mistake, I guess, to get engaged with her. He's like, it's almost like he is kind of okay with it, but he knows he can't stay. Like, he would if he could, but he won't because he can't. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. He never, like, admits that, like, oh, this is a mistake and I really love you. I, like, I accidentally did this by mistake. It's kind of like, yeah, it's different. <laughs> it's just different. So, Serial 7, we've only got two more to go here. Serial 7 is the Sensorites. Um, another science fiction episode. This one is written by Peter R. Newman. Which I looked this guy up because I feel like the Sensorites is not that bad a story. Peter R. Newman doesn't... This is his the only story he's contributed to Doctor Who. And it was because he apparently wrote the Sensorites and then he just like... It... <laughs> If you look at his Wikipedia article, it says he developed, in, like, severe writer's block, is what it says. Severe writer's block. And then he never wrote another episode again, or another anything again. Which I'm like, that's, what a wild story, like, super interesting. <laughs> um, and then he died uh, 11 years later, um, in 75. I don't know what to make of that. Um, the Sensorites is kind of a weird story. It establishes, like, these aliens in the sense sphere. They're, like, telepathic alien beings. And um, they basically... So the TARDIS lands on this, like, spaceship. Um, which I, I wanted to say this feels almost like a very modern episode. Where it's just, like, the TARDIS just lands somewhere and they're just in the thick of some some weird plot. You know? And it's like they land on a spaceship... And, like, these these people are just being controlled by something. And they find out that they're being controlled by these aliens who, like, have this telepathic hold over them. Um, but it isn't affecting the TARDIS team just yet. So the Sensorites try to board on the ship, and then they try to stop the Sensorites. And then we find out that Susan has, like, this interestingly weird connection with them specifically. Like, she has a stronger sort of telepathy with them in order to communicate with them better than anybody else. And they uh, basically determine that, oh, this planet has uh, a certain metal. Let me look it up. Molybdenum. 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 Uh, it's apparently a really, like, I don't know, valuable metal. And so 
past humans arrived on the Sensorites planet, found they had molybdenum, and then was going to, like, leave and go back to their own planet and bring a bunch of people back to, like, mine the molybdenum. They were going to take over the Sensorites planet. The Sensorites sense this because, again, they have telep they're these weird telepathy aliens. They sense this, and they decided to stop them from leaving. And they also defended themselves now against uh, any threat of humans or people that might come to their planet to discover the molybdenum <laughs> that they have. Um, and so, obviously, that's why they've affected the this ship so much. Um, one of the guys on this ship is, like, severely, like, uh, they they kind of drive him a little bit insane specifically um but they're able to like bring everybody down once the doctor like confronts the sensorites he's like hey you guys like drove this dude insane like let's work this out we don't have any plans to like steal your molybdenum we want to figure this out and then they go back to this the sensorites planet because the sensorites aren't really that bad they're not really evil necessarily they're willing to work together um but the the villain of these serials happens to be uh, the town counselor. What's his name? The town counselor, I think. Oh, the city administrator. Yeah, so the city administrator is kind of like scheming. He doesn't trust the, the humans. And they're all like talking. They're all trying to figure this, this whole thing out. Oh, they find out that Ian is... Ian gets sick because he drinks like water forgot about this he drinks water that is like not made for the like upper class like the there's he drinks like lower class water and he starts getting sick and then they start determining like they have to figure out why everybody's getting sick and then they figure out um water is poisonous <laughs> it's just poison water <laughs> And then they 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 come up with a solution, but initially the solution is like taken away. It's this whole plot where the the, the like town the, the city administrator is being like a jerk, and he's like trying to sabotage the humans because he didn't trust them. And they eventually find out that that's what's happening. Um, I will say that the um, so the way this ends, the final episode is they go into the caves, and they find the uh, the humans. There's three humans left in the cave, and they were the ones poisoning the water supply, I believe. And so they just kind of stop them. But the only thing I don't really like about the ending is that I feel like it kind of, like, it moves on past the whole city administrator plot line, and he kind of gets stopped off screen because they, they just kind of mention him offhand or, like, yes, once we determined that this was happening, we knew that he was a bad guy, and so we arrested him. And they just talk about that off screen, like, even though he was, like, the villain for most of this, he just kind of gets arrested off screen. I don't know. <laughs> it's just kind of a weird way that it ended, and it wasn't like it was kind of built up that I guess we were going to discover these humans uh, in the tunnel. But I don't know. It's it's a decent enough episode. It's not terrible at all. Uh, I quite enjoy it. <sighs> And then they leave and everyone's happy. Uh, the final episode, the final serial of season one is The Reign of Terror. And I try to I try to watch all of this like as quickly, like as one after another as possible. The Reign of Terror I just watched today. Um, out of all of these. And uh, it's been... <laughs> uh, I don't know how real I should be about this. I didn't. I watched like portion of it yesterday. I've been kind of slacking off because I meant to wa watch finish this off like either yesterday or the day before. And I watched like a portion of this yesterday and then a portion of it today. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> I should have. I should have watched this quicker. Anyways, the Reign of Terror. I finished this today. Uh, the Reign of Terror. I feel like is really. I almost. I feel like your enjoyment of it depends on how much you actually know about the French Revolution. It takes place in the French Revolution. Um, and the Doctor... Uh, it's established, actually... Hold on. I have to uh, look at my check my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. 
Um, oh yeah, in the sense rights, they do mention that there's a the doctor mentions some sort of her- adventure with Henry the Eighth that ne- never happens in the show. Might happen in extended media. Who knows? Oh, there's an acknowledgement in this episode that Susan, you know, when Susan wants to go <coughs> with the sense rights, kind of by herself. <clears throat> Um, that she is like growing up and that the doctor is not like not letting her sort of flourish and be in a, become an adult, uh, and, you know, deal with her own problems. He still treats her like a child. So that's the, that's the first part of that, that we're seeing now. Um, and it's definitely a, a plot element that's going to, you know, go further is Susan just kind of aging, um, and becoming an adult over this. Um, I did. Oh, that's. I did want to mention more of the characters throughout this, um, where I said like Bar- Barbara really flourishes in the Aztecs. Um, I do want to kind of like do a rundown, I guess, of like the characters themselves. Um, so Ian is definitely like the. He's uh, he's a science teacher. Um, but he's definitely like the brawn and the sort of main source of heroicism. Anytime there's like somebody that needs to be beat up or something that, you know, something that needs to be lifted and or built. Uh, Ian usually takes care of that. He's definitely like the hero of the group. He's got a heart of gold. He's a good guy. <coughs> we love Ian. Um, Barbara is, um, like I said early on, she's not like, I don't feel like her role is really well established, but she does kind of come into her own where she is very like level headed. Weirdly enough, she's very level headed later on and she is very capable of um, a lot of her expertise is in history. So she's able to like tell where are we, who am I talking to based on <clears throat> the things around her. She's very knowledgeable about history. Um, she also has kind of, I don't want to say like a, a wealth of romances. She actually has, I feel like more romances. <coughs> I mean, she has the most romances out of anybody. She kind of has like a brief, I would say like romance with one of the talls in the Daleks. Um, and she also has a romance with... Um, in the Reign of Terror as well. The man named Leon. Uh, weirdly enough, Ian doesn't have any romances, I don't think, at all that I remember. Uh, the Doctor has the one romance. Susan doesn't have any romances. She's too young. Um, well, would you, would you call it? Or, she is like, they do try to marry her in the Aztecs because it's like Aztec society that... Like, oh, you are to be given to a husband, and then she's really mad about that. It's not really a romance <laughs> at all, obviously. But <laughs> it's kind of like, I guess, the closest thing to a romance, I guess, that you could call. Yeah, anyways, um, Susan's Susan's role in all of this, I think, is that she's just the most compassionate. She's the most comparing, uh, caring about uh, uh, people and things. She's often very naive and often is the first one to fall into a trap. But um, she's a good, she's ultimately a good person. She's ultimately out there to do the right thing. The doctor, on the other hand, he is honestly the weakest in terms of like moral uh, qualities. (laughs) He's very often selfish, apathetic, uh, very often just kind of um, out there to, uh, for his own specific scientific interest. Um, but over the course of this season, he does develop, uh, which I think is really good. I mean, this first season is really well done just because of how the characters sort of develop over this. And the doctor does a lot of developing, um, especially into like, um, like, like the Aztecs where he like, you know, um, you know, he, he relates to Barbara in a lot of ways when he's talking to her about how he can't change history. He says something like, Believe me, I'm, I've tried many times. Uh, you can't do it. You can't change a single line of it. Like, he he is sympathetic towards her desire to do so, but he's like, you can't do this. 
But I think, weirdly enough, I think that the Reign of Terror is the Doctor's, like, standout episode. This is the episode where he shines, I think, more than <laughs> a lot of the other episodes. A lot of the other episodes... <sighs> My ability to speak is not good. And a lot of the other episodes, he does good things. Obviously, he's able to solve the the central issue at the end of the day, right? In this, in the Sensorites, he's able to, like, find... He's the one that figures out that the planet has molybdenum on him, and he's able to look at the, the spectrograph or whatever, and he's like, oh, as you can see, these trace elements. This is why <clears throat> the sensorites are probably doing this. He is the one that, that figures out most most of the things, <laughs> you know, most of the mysteries, most of the problems. He's the one that solves them. Um, if there's, like, a mystery, if there's, like, a problem that needs solving, he's the one that does all of that. He's the clever one. Yeah, I feel like Reign of Terror is, like, the best doctor episode it's in this he kind of gets left behind mostly because oh what a weird story so um this is also one that has missing episodes it only has two missing episodes so it's watchable but not on like amazon on like BritBox. um you have to like find the episodes by themselves and then the two of the episodes are actually animated though at the very least the two missing episodes so you can find the animated versions of them but even those you would think though this would mean that the whole episode should be like the whole serial should be available on BritBox somewhere i feel like if there was a animation recreation that it should be available on amazon as part of just the main seasons on BritBox. it should just be there like oh it starts to play the animation but no, you have to like buy it separately in every single case. But even a situation like this, where the 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 um the frickin, uh the recreation, the animation for this was created in 2013, so this is like an older animation, and it's only the two episodes. Whereas like the modern animations, they do the whole thing, they reanimate the entirety of it, even the episodes that are not missing. Um, and those they they put out as like a an entire like serial that you can buy you have to buy all of the episodes but there's no offering of like reign of terror as like a full thing unless you buy like the, the dvd that like released in 2013 like god this is all so stupid it's so stupid and like the only way to watch these is like is like shitty websites that suck they used to be good that suck now and i hate these websites i'll say nothing more about it Anyways, the TARDIS crew gets embroiled in, like, the uh, the whole plot of the French Revolution. Um, they kind of just, like, inadvertently happen upon two uh, rebels, and they end up at their mansion. And then these rebels get attacked. The mansion gets, uh, you know, attacked by the soldiers. And then these French soldiers uh, end up taking Barbara, Susan, and Ian as prisoner... And then the doctor gets left behind in the mansion. <coughs> and then they burn down the mansion. So the, for the rest of the serial, a lot of the characters, uh, you know, Barbara, Susan, Ian, aren't even sure if the doctor's alive. But uh, over the course of this, at the prison, okay, Barbara and Susan and Ian, um, there's a guy that comes in. Let me get his name. Let me remember his name. I'm not... 100% on my French Revolution history. Lemaitre? 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 I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Uh, he's like this this guy that shows up at the prison. Um, and specifically, um, when Ian gets sent to the prison, he gets sent with this guy named Webster. And this guy named Webster is like dying. And he says, oh, you have to find this guy named James Sterling. Uh, and it's this whole thing. And then Lemaitre shows up at the prison, and then he crosses Ian's name off of the list to be executed for some reason. And then Barbara and Susan get sent off to the guillotine. But as they get sent off to the guillotine, it gets attacked by some other counter-revolutionaries. Or revolutionary? Counter-revolutionaries? Uh, and their names are Jules and Jean. Um... Ian, meanwhile, is left in prison. Uh, but he's able to escape because the jailer is at one point uh, distracted by Lemaitre, and uh, he leaves the 
key in the cell, and Ian's able to take the key and escape, um, only to be attacked by Jules and Jean and then taken to the safe house, and they're all reunited at that point. Um, except for the doctor, who, <laughs> meanwhile, as he escaped, he's able to escape from the house because there's this young child who, like, rescues him, and then um, he goes and he gets a change of clothes. It's, it's this whole thing where the doctor, like, goes on his... This is what I'm saying. It's like he's, he kind of shines a little bit in this because he goes... He, it, it, it's also established as a, the French Revolution is apparently his favorite era. They just say that. This is a line that they say. Um... He gets, like, a change of outfits, and then he goes and walks into the prison, and he just, like, he's just able to use this, like, manipulation tactic of just the way he speaks to everybody just to kind of, like, get where he wants to go. Um, he's able to just walk into these places and just, like, take over and, and, and trick people into, like, <coughs> doing what he wants. He's, like, this master manipulator. Like it's it's brilliant. So it, he he really shines in this episode, <laughs> in this series of episodes. I will say it's very fun to watch him just like go around and just like trick all of these people that are that would normally be pretty scary in positions of authority. It just makes them all look like fools, and it shows like this is his strength. This is this is why he's he's the, the uh, he's the leader of the of the group, right? And then he's uh. <laughs> Some things that happen, let's just say. Yeah, a whole thing. Ian gets re they get recaptured again. Ian gets like tortured. Susan and Barbara are able to get out. Uh, the Barbara is reunited with the doctor. The doctor's able to get Barbara out, and then Susan's able to get out. Oh, but it's only because Susan gets sick. I don't even know if there's like a reason that Susan gets sick. She just gets sick. And so they go to a physician, and then the physician is like is like, oh, these guys are, like, weird and suspicious and reports them and they get taken back to prison. Uh, but she, I don't know why she got sick and she just, like, gets better. But um, they all eventually end up back at the safe house and then it's, it's we fi figure out that Lemaitre uh, was actually a good guy the whole time. And uh, that they're going to go, like, try to save Robespierre. The, the the final episode kind of wraps up weirdly where they like they're like oh well we know Robespierre is gonna get go to the guillotine and then we also know that like Napoleon's gonna be the new uh leader <sighs> it's very it's very weird because they're like embroiled in this like plot line with like these characters and then all of a sudden they're like ha huh. like it's literally like like Barbara just is like starts laughing because she's like well, we know what's going to happen now. Like, we can't change anything about it. And it, like, it just kind of all, the rest of the plot just kind of happens off screen where they're, like, this, this, I don't know, this whole thing that was, like, being built up to is just, like, kind of shoved aside because it's like, oh, well, now we know it. We know what happens from this point onwards. But everybody's together now, so the story's over, right? And so at that point, they just kind of go back to the TARDIS and the story kind of just ends. Um, whereas Robespierre gets, uh, yeah guillotine and that's kind of the end that's the end of the first season um it's actually a lot of episodes <laughs> we count how many episodes that was one it's 42 episodes which is like really lengthy for like a tv show like a like a modern tv show it's really long isn't it two, two hours sorry 40 i forgot what i just said 41 episodes 42 episodes uh <clears throat> that's a lot um and i wanted to kind of run through them as quickly as possible so I could, you know, um, speak as... I could remember them all very concretely when I went to record this, and I, I don't know. I might have waited a little too long. I might have been put... I, I think I put a day in between where I was like, I don't feel good, and I just didn't watch anything. But I tried my best to watch through these all in, in like, succinct order. I've watched all of them before, um, but... Yeah, I'm rewatching. I rewatched them <laughs> uh, again. So it's it's actually a really strong season, honestly. The first season, not bad at all. The first TARDIS team, pretty brilliant. I don't even know if I would say there's like a better TARDIS team than just the uh, the OG. And I know that probably sounds really like hipster of me to say, 
It's like uh, I only think the first the first <laughs> companions are the best companions, but I'm like I I keep trying to think of like who I think which companions I think had better dynamic, and I just think the the problem is a lot of them don't have like I feel like because there's four of them, it feels like a very complete dynamic, and I also feel like the first doctor more than any other doctor has like a lot of flaws he's very flawed but the other companions sort of complete him <laughs> you know they sort of like they they compensate for his flaws you know there's the there's a moment oh i didn't even mention in the reign of terror the very beginning of the episode is like when they're complaining about like uh ian and barbara want to go home and they're like send us home and the doctor and susan Susan gets kind of upset because she doesn't want them to leave, but the doctor's, like, upset also. He's, like, he gets mad. <laughs> He's, like, oh, well, oh, yes, just leave then, shall Yes, just go home then. And then uh, he, like, pilots them back home, and they make a comment, like, hey, doctor, you know you, you're not very good at, like, piloting. Like, you don't always, you almost never bring us, like, where we want to go. Um, it's kind of scary, actually, because he's, like, oh, we're definitely where we're supposed to be. And they weren't. They were they were in they, they were in France in the French Revolution. They weren't he, he was trying to take them back home and he failed. Um, but again, it's just one of the flaws of the character, right? Um, and Ian and Barbara they like understand his like wiliness, I guess, and they've definitely grown over the course of this where they they don't hate him really. Um, but it's like yeah, they want to go home and it's like reasonable for them to want to go home. Like you just I don't know everything makes a lot of sense to me and so beyond that it's like hard to say like what other TARDIS team like really like it feels like as complete as this you know um because very few of them have this many companions and part of the problem is like I feel like the doctor from this point onwards he definitely like absorbs the traits of all three of these characters like he absorbs the um, the heroic braveness of Ian, the historical knowledge of like Barbara and the level headedness, um, and the compassion from Susan, the the desire to like go out and help people that just just because they need the help, right? And it's like he absorbs all these qualities, and then he becomes kind of this very complete human being that they're mm, time lord. That's not flawed at all, right? And then the companion is just kind of like the, almost like the comic relief. It's like the the straight man and the and the jester or whatever you call the one that's not the straight man. It's just the the person that doesn't understand anything and kind of like creates the problems and creates the trouble, or kind of like teacher and student. It's kind of the di dynamic they 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 adopt uh, later on. I feel like, yeah, I guess it's just a big part of what's missing is just the doctor's, the doctor's flaws. He should have a lot of flaws. <laughs> and uh, it just allows for the companions to very much complete him. I don't know. I, you know, we'll revisit a lot of this stuff as we go on, I suppose. I don't know how far we'll get into this before uh, I die of old age. But, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, feel free to like leave any comments you have any thoughts about uh, what I discussed here I might you know I, I might be excited to discuss any thoughts you might have about the the first season of Doctor Who yourself um, anything I forgot to mention here I hope I remembered everything I wanted to talk about here I feel like I talked for a long time but um, yeah, next, I'm, next, I will be covering the Klepton Parasites, but I will say I'm not going to be covering, uh, sorry, the Klepton Parasites, um, but also, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to be covering the Klepton Parasites, so the TV comics, Klepton Parasites through Shark Bait. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, I'll just read all of them. Klepton Parasites, Therovian Quest, The Hijackers of Thrax, On the Web Planet, The Gyros Injustice, Challenge of the Piper, Pri Prisoners of Gritog, 
Moon Landing, Time in Reverse, Lizard World, Prisoners of the Kleptons, The Caterpillar Man, The Ordeals of Demeter, Enter the Go-Ray, and Sharkbait. Okay? Those are the comics I'm going to be reading for the next episode. I'm going to discuss all of those in the next episode. Um, It's not all of the first Doctor TV comics. It's half of them. Uh, I just decided I would divide it by year, just kind of arbitrarily. So it's mostly the ones that came out in 1965. Um, But additionally, um, unfortunately, this also... I probably should have covered season two first, but because I'm doing it in this order, I kind of wanted to do... Uh, just separate it, do season one, do the comics, and then do season two, and then do more comics. <laughs> just kind of that kind of... Otherwise, I should have probably done Doctor Who season one as the very first episode that I did, right? But it, because I didn't do it that way, um, I'm kind of left to do it this way. So we'll do season two after that. Um, and then maybe it'll be a little bit before we get to season three. I'm not so sure, but we'll find out. Um but that, that'll do it for uh, Doctor Who Season 1 discussion. Yeah. Any thoughts? Leave them in the comments. Uh, and that'll be it. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, quick appendix uh, to the end of this. I just wanted to mention the uh, new Doctor Who season. Uh, I guess it's Season 1. Of, they're like, it's like like a reboot, technically, I guess. They're calling it Season 1. Um, I am going to, I'm planning on reviewing it on my main channel. This is not my main channel. This is a secondary channel, although I have, I have like four channels. <laughs> um, but I will be reviewing the new season of Doctor Who on my main channel, which is, uh, A-N-T-I-X-E-S-I-S, Antixesis, if you want to check that out. Um, obviously in the book club, this is something that I would probably be getting to like 300 years from now. So (laughs) I just want to mention that I'm going to be reviewing it. It's, it's not going to be exactly the same sort of thing that I'm doing here. It's not going to be as in depth, but I'm just going to be talking about it. And, uh, so if you're interested in that, um, it will be coming out whenever the final episode airs. So, uh, yeah, thought it was a probably a good idea to just mention that okay thanks for watching goodbye